The leader in amateur baseball is perfect game globally. And the global leader in amateur baseball content right here on Perfect Game TV. Hi there, folks, and welcome to the Visit Panama City Beach College Baseball Classic. You want a battle of the great state of Florida? Two programs with rich traditions and histories, national championships at the JUCO level, you've got it. Out of South Florida, Miami Dade College, the Sharks, and Jeff Johnson's, the Hall of Fame coach, the Chipola Indians. We are going toe to toe, and what a great one it is. Hi there, folks. Steve Phillips, the legendary leader of men at this sport, player of this sport, and developer of talent. My name is Darren Sutton. Glad to have you with us, and Steve, a heck of a host as well every single day on MLB Network Radio. Just to bring you up to speed of what you may have missed in the last game, and there was a lot. I mean, there was an awful lot going on in what turned out to be a, a big offensive game. With McLennan coming out on top of State College of Florida, they couldn't do it. In the end, it was State College of Florida that came back despite the big offense, an 11-9 victory. We did see early on great prospects, though. We saw Gavin Jones of McLennan. We saw Brandon Clark of State College of Florida. These are two athletes, left-handed pitchers, up into the mid-90s. They will have pro baseball on the other side. But in the end, we saw Palmer O'Byrne there, the left-handed pitcher, number 15 on his jersey. It was a big outburst for State College of Florida, a five-run third. They were victorious. So now, onward and upward. To the next game we go as the Indians take the field, the Chipola squad, the talented team. And again, a team with so much history, national championship history. They won it all in 2017. I had the good fortune of being behind the microphone on MLB and on the MLB Network. This is the starting lineup for Miami Day. Michael Perez at the very top. Petit right behind him. It's Guzman, Ortiz, Garcia, and Brown. Carillas. Hakame and Zamora all the way down to the bottom. They were 34 and 16 a year ago. Miami Dade, an incredibly strong program. Lorenzo Lanis, the head coach, Giannis, I should say. And on the mound for Chipola, a chance to get to know Lucas Ellisalt. Ellisalt, the sophomore at Mariana, Florida, which means if you know your geography, he's home. Mariana is the home to Chipola, kind of right there in the center, north central of the state. This right-hander goes to work, and uh, I need to let Steve Phillips talk with all his wisdom. Steve, it's fun to be here. Day three, I know we've grinded through a lot of baseball. We haven't been disappointed, nor have the viewers. No, not at all. I think there's a lot of talent out there, some interesting, some good approaches at the plate for some of the offensive players, pitchers. The key learning today, throw strikes. That's been critical. This young man has a very repeatable delivery, very athletic on the mound, flexible. Uh, it looks to me like he's going to be able to repeat that release point. Could be critical in the game. The other thing to keep an eye on here, the shadows could be a factor. You see them starting to creep in around home plate right now. Could make it a little bit difficult this time of day at twilight for some of the hitters to pick up the pitches coming into the plate. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about it. And you've noticed that I love listening to your scout's eye as it takes a peek at athletes. And a lot of times, traditionally, when we think about pitchers, we don't think about flexibility and athleticism. But that really has turned out to be something that is so important when you think about the evolution of this position. And he looks it. I mean, he looks the part. He does look flexible. He does look athletic. And he comes north from Miami, by the way. Miami-Dade, not too far from where he grew up. But for Lucas, he makes the choice to go to Chipola. And you look at him, 6'4", 190, long, loose, lakely, lanky, projectable body for sure. Uh, and uh, you see him working out of the stretch. I like that. I mean, as you're warming up, I mean, Greg Maddox would always talk about that he would do his bullpen sessions exclusively from the stretch position because it's where he needs to make his most important pitches, so he practices that the most. Michael Perez gets things started. From Miami, Florida, center fielder by trade. He has been in that position for a long, long time. Born in Cuba, grew up in Miami. Nixie and Yosvani, his parents. And away we go, game three of our broadcast schedule today. He pours a firm fastball in there for strike one. And off and running in this fun one between Miami Dade and Chipola. 
See the shadows creeping in. Both these teams have gotten busy. One team playing four games. Chipola's two and two. Miami Dade has played three games. They are two and one. Perez five for 13, make it five for 15 to open the year. Breaking ball just off the plate with that five for 15. There's been a walk as well. So is on base in this young season for this right-handed hitter, 375. Had a little build like a Starling Marte a little bit uh, at home plate. Or this athletic, you know, long, lanky, strong, wiry guy. Fights that one off in on his hands. Dumps it into center field. Back behind the second base bag. Michael Perez, who as an amateur, hustles past the bag. Did he get back? He did. That is a hustle. Two bases, if I've ever seen it, nearly slid past the bag, but he got back. That's a guy that's been hungry to get out there on the field. And a jam shot, look at that, right out of the batter's box. He's thinking, you know what? Deep in center field, taking their time to get to it. Here he comes, chugging into second base. Outstanding effort on his part. And uh, what a way to start the day for Miami Dade. Calls his dad his greatest inspiration. Young Mike Call has earned medals while playing as a, as a youth, as an amateur down in Cuba. So very decorated as a young man down in grade school, elementary school age group. And Michael Petit now right behind him. Crouches in that stance in the box. And the breaking ball drops it in there for strike one. Petit from Melbourne, Florida. Plays his travel ball for a good program. Florida travel ball, FTB, the Phillies. Back-to-back -back breaking balls, and the count is 0-2. Way to work ahead. That's one of the things we've seen today is how, many, how much trouble pitchers get into when they fall behind on the count. One, you walk too many, but two, you put hitters in counts where they can pigeonhole you, wait for a pitch in that zone, or just sit on a fastball. This man's a big Braves fan as he swings the bat, chases the fastball. Good 0-2 pitch. It looked like he was sitting back expecting to see another break a ball, and he ran it right by him. Yeah, it beat him. It, uh, it beat him in one of those ones where maybe he's looking breaking ball, maybe just not picking the ball up all that well as the shadows creep in a little bit right there. But he was definitely behind it. And for many hitters, you know, they don't take bad swings. It's just timing is the issue. It's hard to make a good swing on a bad pitch and hard to take a good swing if your timing's off. Dean Guzman, another right-handed hitter, gets the call now. Dean, 5 of 11 to open the season. He has homered as well this year. He has walked five times. That means Dean's been on base 10 times in his first three games. From Pembroke Pines, Florida. That fastball's got some giddy up. You know, I keep watching uh, Prez on second base, and he does it where he leans back and points back toward the base. And every time he's done it is when the catcher has set up on the outside corner. Now, he's making it look like it's just his jockeying off the base a little bit, but you wonder if there's some gamesmanship and potentially signaling and helping out the hitter. He takes off toward third, throw it down, tags there, not in time. Slid right on around that tag, and oh, so much energy out there with Michael Perez. Uh, you steal third base off of the pitcher. He gets a pretty good jump right there. The slide, avoiding the tag, and then, whoa. Uh, 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 uh. I mean, I guess he got his foot into the bag after he slid past it with his hand, uh, but uh, that was a close call. Jeff Johnson wants to talk about it for a minute and maybe speak with this pitcher as well, the Hall of Fame coach, the legend at Chipola. Got a chance to spend some time with Jeff at the ABCA, the coaches convention, uh, amongst the 8,000 coaches that were in the Dallas, Texas area. A lot of good people in college baseball, but subjectively, that's just me saying it, there may not be many better than Coach Johnson at Chipola. Big Dean, another chance now with the runner at third. 
Breaking ball. Waves over the top of that one. Excellent pitch, 2-2, two and two, the count. Good 2-1 pitch. Yeah, Ellis Salt has a nice breaking ball. He really does. He's a lot of confidence in it, throws it with conviction. He starts it on the outside corner and then breaks it off the plate. You see them setting up away, starts it on the corner, makes it look like a strike as it's coming out of his hand and then breaks it off the plate and away from the bat. The 2-2 two -two from Ellis Salt. Wave and a miss. Nice job behind the plate. Blocking it up. The runner stays at third. Xander Bucken doing a nice job putting his nose on top of the baseball, his catcher. And here it comes again, that breaking ball. Outstanding job there, and that trust in the catcher that Bradley Willis is going to be able to block it in the dirt. He's able to do it. Can't make the tag, but able to look the runner back, freeze him at third base, and get the assist with the out at first. D'Angelo Ortiz. High fastball, 1-0, and oh, the count to Ortiz. Angelo from Miami, 2022 grad, born in Boston. That pitch sails high. Got to be careful right here. 2-0 count. I wouldn't be surprised with first base open and the cleanup hitter up that he, he might go breaking ball right here. I wouldn't give him anything too good to hit right now. Nah, Jess takes that one as a strike. The son of Hall of Famer David Ortiz. World Series MVP, three-time World Series champ. Now it's his journey to write. Makes a strike over the extended corner. I can hear Big Poppy right now saying, swing at that pitch right there. What are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> Has traveled back and forth, played baseball down in the Dominican Republic as well. To Westminster Christian. Two two. Breaking balls outside. Last year Ortiz. Three twenty eight and forty eight games. Breaking ball. Boy, he has saved that one in his hip pocket. There was a double. There was a stolen base. And then guess what else? Three strikeouts to strand that runner on the diamond. And Michael Perez, who had a hustle double to open up the inning. And a stolen base as well. Chipola getting ready to swing the bats. Glad to have you with us at the Visit Panama City Beach College Baseball Classic.
Taylor, Espinal, Diaz, and then it's Willis, Parker, Vanek, Ortiz, J.P. Ortiz, Bennett, and Buckin, the catcher who did a nice job behind the plate, and the legendary Hall of Fame head coach, Jeff Johnson. Juan Miguel Fernandez takes the rock and he rolls. Number 23 on that jersey. Cuban born and raised. 5'11", 185 right-hander. Good fastball. Ready for it was Taylor. Fly ball left field. Left fielder out there, Dean Guzman. We're 99% sure about that, and Guzman <laughs> makes the play for the out. Well, we've you seen the ball the hit here give some trouble to infielders and outfielders today, so something to keep an eye on as the sun starts to come down a little bit and the sky darkens. Uh, we'll see whether that's any benefit or not. Hey, you pointed that out, and it's, it's something that's just so important at this point now. Aiden Espinal, the second baseman. Aiden, two for 12 to open the year, but he's got five walks. That means that's a 444 on base. And he whips that bat through the zone, drives it toward the wall in right center field. It's off the wall. Espinal flying on around, heading toward third. Head first slide. It's a triple for Aiden. Love the passion and energy with which he plays. A little spark plug on the team. And a little bit of pop. Not a big guy, but he's got some big pop in that bat. He's able to drive the baseball. He got some buggy whip in that bat. And out of the box, he's going. You get triples, not when you round first, not when you round second, but you get them when you leave the batter's box. You're thinking three all along. Does a really good job getting in and a good way to get things going. Man on third, one out. A little more exciting play in baseball than the triple. Many would debate that, but it's just so much fun to see. You can hit a long home run. You can drop down a beautiful bunt single, something unique. But boy, you hit that triple. Everyone's in it for the run all the way around the bases. And you could hear his teammates. Isaiah Diaz has an opportunity now. Went to ESB Academy, was a 2023 grad. Played his travel ball for a good program. Richie Palmer runs that elite squad program, runs the ESB as well. That's where he did his developing. One and one the count. Nice job holding right there. Korea's behind home plate, claiming that one up in a beautiful manner. He has two of seven to start the year with a walk. 400 on base clip early to open things. That's a great shot of the cat and mouse right there, isn't it? It really is. And, and keeping an eye on him there, making sure he gets the right sign. But also looking for a strikeout in this situation. Try to get a swing and a miss and, and get out of this, leaving that runner at third, avoiding the productive out. And obviously for Diaz, looking to be able to put the ball in play infield back trying to find a way to just pick up that run he does get the strikeout i think he was looking for a secondary pitch as down he goes yeah not the best balance right there right the idea of of stay in there go right back up the middle with it and you see him sort of the front side leaking and the ball tailing away good movement on that pitch last pitch 90 miles an hour as Brantley Willis takes it in off the plate. Brantley has opened the year 6 of 10, an incredible start. He has driven in nine runs in his first four games. He's homered, walked three times. 7-1-4 on base percentage early on. Big, strong young man right here. Good take on a breaking ball that time. You know, there's different ways for pitchers to be effective. Sometimes it's velocity where you just beat hitters. But other times it's movement 
in deception, in sequencing, and Fernandez more of the guy who mixes and matches his pitches. 3-0 and oh the count. Breaking ball drops that one in there. 3-0 breaking ball. A little respect right there, I would say, uh, for Willis at the plate. Willis had a great summer last year playing in the Valley League for Front Royal in 20 games at a 925 OPS. Did he? He did not. And so it's a walk. That's not the Runners worst result. First and third. Yeah, Why is not that, the worst Steve? result. I think right there you've got the cleanup hitter. You fell behind in the count, and at that point, you don't want to throw him a 3-1 fastball, give him something to be able to hit and do damage with. I mean, listen, whether he's at first base and you get a fresh count with Parker coming up, it sure seems to me like the better result. Good shot at the focus from our third base camera, that right-handed pitcher is that one. Misses outside. This is Sam Parker, the left fielder. Sam graduated just this past year in 2023. The Twins thought enough of him to pick him in the 19th round, and they at least had some conversations in that 19th round. We went around that time. So already a, a positive step in his career to be drafted. When he graduated, I can remember this. Sam was the number one first baseman in Georgia's ranked by PG, number eight in the nation, 6'5", 225. One and two. I suspect he goes something soft right here uh, and uh, keeps him off balance. As it certainly seems like Parker geared up for the, the heater and really having a tough time reacting and keeping his hands back to handle the off speed. Rose him with a breaking ball. He made a pitcher's pitch if I've ever seen one. Didn't need to turn it up. That was a beautiful pitch. 12 to 6 breaking ball. Talk about momentum, too. You strand that runner at third. That was a one out triple. And you figured at that point, when Espinal took off and hurried all the way around, that there'd be a run for Chipola. Uh uh, says Juan Miguel Fernandez. He shut her down. Moving along to the second, a fun one. There's Stephen Darren. Thanks for hanging with us on Perfect Game TV. These two great programs. Chipola, Miami Dade. How about some college baseball? Can you believe it? It's just, just flipping the calendar into February or seeing it on our smartphones. I'm trying to speak a little bit more modern. This has been so much fun. And away we go. Ellisal zips a fastball in there. Meet Jeremy Garcia. He is the designated hitter, number 10 on that jersey.
Pulls the hands in, lines that one to center field. They sit. Got a fastball that he can handle. Just gets the bat head to it. Doesn't try to do too much. Takes it right back up the middle. Love that approach. Right, go back up the middle. That's we see so much of hitters today, just dead pulled hitters. And, and today, through the number of games, we've seen some really nice hitting with guys looking to make contact and trying to punch the ball where it's been pitched. I like watching this man play, and I have for years, seeing him at the lower amateur levels. Kerry Herndon Brown, as he is straightened up by a fastball. He's from Germantown, Maryland. Went to IMG for a bit. We saw him play his travel ball for multiple teams. That one in and out of the catcher's mid it goes. I think we assigned Kerry another name there, but it's Kerry Herndon Brown. Played for the Dirt Bags for the Philly Scout team. I even had a chance to watch him play for MLB's Hank Aaron and Dream Series. Also went down and played in Jupiter. Order of Kerry and Shareem. Active on the travel ball circuit and a good player. Runner on the move. No, he bluffed. Getting the infielders to move in case he was able to get a pitch to be able to punch it through. The idea of, look, you saw the infielder starting to break to the base and, the, and uh, you know, the ability for, for Brown to maybe punch it into left field. High sky, left side. Boy, not easy in the end. He stuck with it, though. Knox Bennett called it. J.P. Ortiz was right behind him, and Knox had a drift to his left and made the play. Well, I'm getting PTSD watching the pop-ups today. I am. <laughs> it's bringing me back to some nightmares of, of saying I got it and then thinking to myself, you don't have this. You've got no chance of catching this right now uh, as the, the high sky, the wind, everything in Florida can make it really tough. Drives him back to the bag so they get Kerry Herndon Brown that time. Santiago Correas now. Will snap throw behind the runner. Just got back in. Nice job staying active out there by J.C. Vanek at first. I mean, Jeremy Garcia does have a pretty good lead off of first base, and he's bluffed a couple of times, but not uh, comfortable enough just going all the way. So just trying to get the infielders to move to create some holes. Oh, the ball pops loose. Not quite sure where to go. And when they regain composure, Vanek pops the tag down on him. I'll tell you what, you talk about quick feet. Holy smokes, the feet on Ellis out on the mound. Watch how quick his feet are. That is fantastic right there. That is as good as a, of a right-handed pitcher's move as I've seen. You know, Justin Verlander has a really good right-handed move, and it's all about having good feet. And that is his ability to move his feet and then to execute the throw. That was fantastic. That one wrapped around the inside corner. Yeah, it is such a good point for a right-handed pitcher to have a pickoff play be that one-sided. It was just dropped. Otherwise, it would have been even more laughable with the tag. The fact that it was far enough off that he was able to drop it, grab it, and still tag him out. Pretty curveball. If we have a chance to see that again, the pickoff move. But his feet were so quick. And then the ability to have the quick release and the throw over to first base. Really excellent effort right there. Look at that. That is that is some amazing feet. Right? And good throwing is about good footwork. Even for a pitcher, everything starts from the feet and works its way up. High hop, setting feet, throwing it in time for the out. 
Oh, some fun, some fun athleticism on display here in this one. You got a pick off, you got a ground out, you got a high pop to the left side in the middle of the second inning. Miami Dade and Chipola scoreless. I'm glad to have you with us in Panama City Beach. myself believe that I was gonna be in the big leagues. I always worked for it until I achieved it. Back in Puerto Rico, I remember my dad hit me ground balls from the top of the hill. That forced me to always move my feet. There were no limits to where I could go, so I play with no limits. Coach Jeff Johnson, they won it all. He is in his 28th season. They won it all back in 2017. I can remember that tournament for Chipola that year. It was their second national championship at that point. They had 21 home runs in the event as a team. Wow. Wow. That's good managing right there. I tell you what, you, <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> that's really good managing. You look see that brilliant. tall wall over there. Hit it over it a lot. <laughs> yeah, here's JC. <laughs> Vanek looks at a fastball that zips off the plate. These are two good pitchers. I know they're 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 both pretty athletic. I know you're enjoying them both. Really, I know you're enjoying the work of Ellisalt. Like he dipped that one in there, one and one. You know, Juan Miguel Fernandez reminds me of Levon Hernandez a little bit. Changes speeds, nothing overpowering, but keeps hitters off balance, and he can throw any pitch at any time in the count. Fastball in on the corner. I mean, he stranded the runner at third base, and that was a guy that just went out there and pitched. So we've seen earlier in games, we had throwers on the mound. We've got a couple of pitchers on the mound right now. Breaking ball. Waves over the top of that one. Nice job holding on by Carrillas behind home plate. That's strike three. Again, he last pitched before this one was a fastball. Then he comes back off speed. Ball sort of tailed away. Sort of a backup breaking ball a little bit. But had him fooled out on that front foot. Cuban-born right-handed pitcher. Comes right after on the attack with a fastball to J.P. Ortiz. It's a mile high, and there you go. Yeah. There's Steve's PTSD again. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm actually breaking out in hives right now. I mean, nice guy. <laughs> I mean, he said, I got it, I got it, I got it. And then is, at some point you realize, I'm not going to catch this. He came in a little bit too far on it, and, and it's embarrassing, but it's but it, he's not the only one. He came in, you know, and... and uh, you know, one of the key things in, in, that I've learned is if you keep your mouth open while you're running to try to catch a ball, your eyes don't jump up and down as much. And so it's something to, to consider when outfielders are running, keep their mouth open because it keeps your head from jiggling and your eyes from moving up and down, which makes it tough to track the ball. J.P. Ortiz. Hammers that breaking ball to deep right field, going back just shy of the wall as Michael Petit able to make the play. Ortiz, a talented athlete. He was a 17th round pick of the Reds this past year, 2023 draft. He's from Puerto Rico. 
We'll see him are, play again. He has had a fun run. Yeah, there are some players when you look at them, they look like big leaguers, and Ortiz looks mm -hmm. like that. Had some time at IMG as well. That's strike one to Knox Bennett. Bennett, a 2022 grad from Blackshear, Georgia. Takes that breaking ball ready for it. Fights it off and into right field. There's a base hit for Knox. He did a really good job. He got his front foot down on the ground, and then he waited. He didn't get a fastball, but he had his timing set on fastball, kept his hands back, watched the slight hesitation, just waited just a little bit for that pitch to come in, and punched it in the right field. That's very good hitting right there. So it's interesting. I appreciate Xander sharing this with us because I was reaching out to the site. If you say the word Buchanan, that's what you think this name is, but there is no N at the end. It's just right. Buchanan. He says, and he shared it with us. He says it's Buchanan, but without the extra N. So you just say Buchan. Xander Buchan is the name. And I appreciate him for helping us clarify. He's from yeah. Columbia, South Carolina. A lot, of good baseball. Count. a lot of good baseball played down the Carolinas as well. Remember when I was general manager, we drafted uh, Preston Wilson, Mookie Wilson's son from down there. Preston will and I have a terrific major league career. Pretty good pitch. One of my favorites, even post-playing career in the game, Preston Wilson. Very active in giving back to the game. I had a chance to call a bunch of college baseball games with him. A lot like Mookie Wilson, his dad. Terrific guy. Up and away that pitch goes, and so a walk for Buchan. Played his travel ball for the Shy Town Cream. That's a heck of a program as he's out there at first now. Back to the top of the order in Jordan Taylor. You can see him grip that change up there as he takes his sign. And then he makes the adjustment when he puts the hand in the glove. He got a change up grip now. See all the fingers wrapped around it? Then he'll adjust. That one misses inside. I think, Steve, you can tell me. That just tells you when you start with that grip, that just means it's the toughest one to grip within your glove, so you cheat it early. Right, that you might be wiggling your hand if you do it. And I think he actually threw the change up right there, too. Bouncing ball out towards short. They go the easy way, and they flip in time. It's Hakame to Zamora in time for the out. Couple in the books. Chipola goes down with a zero there. Both these teams looking for their first strike. As we move on to the third, Chipola, Miami-Dade at the Visit Panama City Beach College Baseball Classic.
What a beautiful place to enjoy the Rays. Steve and I earlier this week out there flown on the raft doing a little in-between time getting ready for the games. Well, at least one of us is Steve, I think. But anyway, it's beautiful here. We love it. What a great place to visit. These athletes are really fortunate. The legendary coach and player development man, Lazaro Giannis, the head coach, who has come back into this role with Miami Day. They're, they're fortunate to have him back. They really have enjoyed his great career. Carlos Hakame leads it off, the Venezuelan. Active, goes after the first pitch. High hopper out to third, ready for it, was Knox Bennett. One pitch, one out. You know, I'm always amazed how hitters can swing at a breaking ball on the first pitch. You know, I, I would just, you're, I was always programmed, sit on the fastball, wait for it and try to drive it. He gets a breaking ball right there, hits it down the third baseline, hustling out of the box, but well played uh, by Bennett right there with a the strong throw across the infield. Like I would say, take it, live to see another pitch, because sometimes the first strike you see isn't the best strike that you're going to see. Fastball just off the plate. I do also like both these pitchers willing to throw any pitch at any time in the count because of the confidence they have that they can throw it over the plate. Lucas Alisalt has been a joy to watch pitch for Chipola as he pours that fastball in there. One and one the count to David Zamora. Zamora, the son of Freddie and Maria. He remembers his time during youth ball of making trips to Cooperstown, hanging out with teammates. He said, I'll never forget that. He said, that breaking ball is pounded off the turf, and it's a foul ball. Well, that is a great experience. I've taken my boys to the Cooperstown Dreams Park tournaments there, and, and you know they stayed in the dorms and the barracks, and just a terrific experience and part of baseball development, playing against the high level of competition because our kids from Connecticut – it's a different level when you start playing kids from California, Texas, and in Florida. You know, part of that, and then aging into some of the great perfect game events all around the country. Good fastball. That's strike three. Just reared back, showed him the breaking ball, but the nine-hole hitter couldn't catch up with that last one. Well, you throw the breaking ball starting at the top of the zone, and you look at it, and then you throw him the fastball right there as well. And again, it looks out of his hand. He had showed him the breaking ball, so he's thinking breaking ball, and then the fastball goes right by him. Strikeout number four for this right-handed pitcher, Michael Perez. Takes the pitch over the outside corner for strike one. Perez, the hustle double first time up, which just the flare into center field. He never stopped out of the batter's box and ended up on second base. Good take on a pitch that is low and outside to Michael Perez. And we're telling you about with that double, he's got six hits to open the year in just his fourth game. That was his first extra base hit when he picked up that double, had a stolen base as well. It was his second stolen base of the year. Dad was a professional baseball player, Yosvani Perez, in Cuba. Calls his dad his greatest inspiration. Bouncing ball back over the mound and into center field. Kept the bat flat in the zone long enough to pick up a base hit. We see Jordan Taylor come in quickly, fielding it at that time, because he remembers <laughs> the last at bat where the ball was up the middle there, and he didn't... He didn't dog after it, but he didn't get after it as quickly as he could, and we saw Perez end up on second base. Now a good time for a stolen base attempt. Two outs, man on first with a positive hitter at the plate right near and Petit, but you want to get him in scoring position. Here's Michael Petit. That great move to first base might uh, neutralize the running game a little bit here. We'll see. We already won pickoff on Jeremy Garcia in the second inning. We'll see how Perez reads it. Let's go. Let's go. 
ready for it. Toward the left side, on across the diamond. And a good effort there to stick with it. Runner moves up to second base. Infield hit right there, he legged it out. Tough play right here as you see that Ortiz gets his weight on his back foot as he fields the ball and he just doesn't have enough to be able to get the strength of the throw across the infield. A little bit of a bobble there and Petit beating it down, out down the first baseline. Did a good job touching the front side of first base, the closest part to be able to put himself in safely. Dean Guzman struck out. Belt high breaking ball, but the change in velocity enough to have him leaking out front. Couple of singles to start this inning. Neither one of them hit particularly hard, certainly. <laughs> Dean, a 2022 graduate of West Broward High School. 0-2 the count where he played for Coach Howard Stein. Not seeing the ball very well right there. He's chased two pitches out of the zone. And again, that's got to tell Ellisalt, you know, I don't have to throw it over the plate right now to ultimately get him out to get him to chase. Lucas Ellisalt from Southwest Miami Senior High. Spins that one away from the zone outside. Ellisalt's parents, Frank and Jacqueline Ellisalt. There's an older brother, Frank, who's 21. Sibling Aaron is 16. Dad played soccer and tennis competitively. He works on the mound. And it's outside. Okay, now that was a pitch that, that, when you think about it, Guzman did not have to make any decision on. It was the ball coming out of Ellis Salt's hand. So kind of a wasted pitch in that moment. Right, you always want the hitter to have to make a decision. Breaking ball pops away. And that'll do it. Boy, what a strong finish to that one. That is five strikeouts now for this talented pitcher. It's been showing the breaking ball where he needs to. And then coming back and being strong. Steve, this is fun. Yeah, sequencing of pitches and then the deception. The breaking ball right there. The fastball up in the zone getting the swing and miss. The breaking ball again, keeping hitters off balance. He shows the fastball up, throws the curveball in the same plane, and gets the swing and miss. I think our hope is that you're enjoying some baseball today. And again, it's February, and many parts of the country where you may be watching, it's cold. We feel for you. We love you. It's not cold 
Not at all in Panama City Beach, Florida. It's mild. It's a beautiful day for baseball. And that thing called the sun that's peeking through, the fielders don't love it so much right now, but boy, does it make for a great atmosphere. Steve Phillips, Darren Sutton, and you, thanks for being with us. We all get together and enjoy two of these elite programs, national championship caliber programs. Eddie and Espinal leads things off. He had a dynamic hustle triple all the way around the diamond to get things going back in the first inning. The key, though, he was stranded by Juan Miguel Fernandez. Change up right there, changing speeds on him, causing a smile. I'll tell you what, Espinal looks like a grown man in there, though, doesn't he? Yes, he does. There you go, Steve, one more time. Yeah, I tell you, he's got some buggy whip in that bat. You know, he's not a real big guy, but short and quick to the ball, and then he can run, turns on the, the burners, ends up in the third base, and let's show some passion. Stands 5'9". If you've ever built and created a roster or been around that, that probably means he's 5'8". <laughs> As it should be. Doesn't matter. I mean, he really, as you said, really gets that bat through the zone and shows good speed. That fastball too much for him that time as he fouls it off. But he does. You watch his swings, especially on that triple, and he's got finish to it where he just gets it to the, to the zone to the point of contact, and, man, he whips it through uh, to be able to get the bat to the ball and to drive it, to get some launch angle to it. Very quick bat. Fifth game of the year, he's got three hits this year. But along with those three hits this year, he's got five walks. So in game number five, he's been on base eight times already. What a dream in that one or two spot to have that kind of start. Yeah, for sure. Table setter. He's not looking to expand. He'll take that walk number six. He'll be glad to take it. Three, two. There's that buggy whip you talked about again as he drives that one towards center field. But this one is playable by Michael Perez. Well played by Michael Perez. Good jump, good angle on that ball. Well struck off the bat. Being able to run that one down. And man, he tell you what, he finishes and he drives the baseball. But give Perez some credit. Good jump out there. Quick reactions to it. Took the right angle to the ball to be able to make the play. Well done. Fastballs outside. Good call by you. They were definitely playing him to pull, and he had to make up that distance. Quite a bit of it. Zayed Diaz. He struck out back in the first inning. Z-Man, as he is called. George is his dad. Tulani, his mom. And his younger sis. Jolani. I'm sure she misses him now off at college. He just graduated this past year. Sister's 12 as he takes low and outside. You, know, you think about all of these players and their families and the time commitment for the families. I mean, we're watching them here playing college, but to get to this point, the tournaments, the showcases, the events, the practices, the workouts, all of that, so much time committed from families. Well, you couldn't have said it better, Steve. I mean, that's exactly what it is. I mean, it's money, too, right? You go to, you got to stay yep. in hotels. Your kids are traveling. You're moving around. You're trying to give them every opportunity to pursue that dream. But it's a big commitment from families. Big, aggressive swing. He comes up empty on 3-1. Diaz. Kind of like understanding what Steve said. He shares, my father and mother inspire me. Even when we didn't have much, they stopped, never stopped working to make sure that I didn't feel the struggle that was going on day to day. And I was paying attention, he said. And he looks forward to being able to give back to his parents someday. And, you know, there is the sacrifice. There is the struggle. I think the reward, I don't know, sitting in my chair where I get to interview in the end thousands of kids through the years is how many of them are in tune and in touch and are grateful. Yeah. yeah. 
Right, that sense of gratitude is so important. So important. The empathy you have for what your parents have gone through and ultimately make you a good citizen whether your baseball career works out or not. That pitch is high. And most everyone will look back and hopefully come to peace with you know, it working out for everyone, whether it worked out and ended in high school, ended in a JUCO, ended in the big leagues, ended like my father's did at 43 years old and then in the Hall of Fame. You know, I think those of us that have been around it our whole lives feel like it's a, a life developmental tool as well. Yeah, oh, for sure. I mean, what you learn, no matter what sport you play, there's different life lessons to be learned, and certainly baseball particularly teaches you how to deal with failure, to deal with adversity. You fail seven out of ten times, and you're still good in this game. What do you do with the seven? I mean, the three are easy. You feel good about it. What do you do with the other seven? Where do you put that, and how do you deal with it? Swing and a miss. One and two the count. Brantley Willis. He walked back in the first inning. I kind of pitched around him in that first inning after the triple, and uh, Fernandez fell behind in the count and decided, you know, I'm just going to put him on. little difference in the move between the two pitchers. Big take on a breaking ball, running at the 2-2, two -two, keeping an eye on Diaz. He does have a stolen base this year. J.P. Ortiz with the other stolen base. They just have two as a team. Four overall stolen bases in their first three games for Miami Dade. So neither one of these teams running wild to start the year. Oh, what a hammer. Oh, a good emotion, too, pounding that glove. Fired up after executing that pitch. Yeah, went with the breaking ball. And again, that's been his go to effective put away pitch. That is outstanding. He's got tremendous break on it. Really tough to center up. The change of speed off of the fastball. Even though you throw all that hard, it's enough change of speed in the differential to keep hitters off balance. Change up right there. Got him way out in front on the front foot. You think to yourself, all right, I'm going to sit on that fastball. I'm going to get ready to drive it. Then he pulls the string on the very first pitch of the at-bat. Big Sam Parker, boy, when he runs into one, it's just massive. I can remember him at the National Showcase in 2022. Exit Velo, triple digits, earned a 9.5 PG grade, and the reason it was a 9.5 is he earned a 10 grade with his power. Very interesting young hitter, they wrote in the scouting report about him in 2022. That's an interesting pitch to deal with, though. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a that's a real breaking ball right there. I tell you, he he reminds me of Cliff Floyd when Cliff Floyd first came up, uh, and um, in minor league baseball, and that that long, loose, lengthy, but really athletic, and could even run a little bit. Goes out and gets that one. He is strong, so he. Lifts it into the air in center field. Well off the plate outside, though. And in the end, an easy chance for Michael Perez. Fly out to center field. They get the big fella that time. It's a scoreless game. As we move along to the fourth inning, Miami-Dade, Chipola at the Panama City Beach College Baseball Classic.
We're became the global leader in amateur baseball and of course at the collegiate level we're proud to present this tournament. Gulf Coast victorious they beat Pearl River they'll take on St. John's River State College who beat Dyersburg 5-2. Wabash out of Illinois outstanding they beat Andrew College and we'll have that one for you tomorrow against Northwest Florida State College. Coach Martin's team and that's uh, boy, that's a great one. State College of Florida we shared that one with you. Wallace Dothan, boy, what a great story they've been with their second year head coach. And then, of course, Florence Starlington Technical. Flodor, they call it. Beat Chattahoochee Valley 13 to 3. We're the lone game to wrap up today. And uh, we're kind of honored about that. So we're wrapping up baseball at this great complex. That's a good one tomorrow, folks. 10.30 Central, 11.30 Eastern. We'll kick off our day. Northwest Florida State College against Wabash, two of the elite programs in the country. Yeah, Wabash, really looking by the forward way, to that. Yeah, Wabash finished second in the country last year. Three and oh, the count. I mean, interestingly enough, if I might pitch our stuff, if you have the time, don't leave us now, but when this game is over, the Wabash program represented on Perfect Game College Baseball. Hunter Pence co-hosting that show. So go give that a listen when you're done if you want to preview that game a bit. Three and one. Lucas Ellisalt is his name. He's from Miami, Florida. Our color analyst enjoys watching his athleticism. Big poppy son, D'Angelo Ortiz. Chases a fastball up, fouls it off. You know, I've seen so many sons of big leaguers, and many of them, their swings resemble their fathers. You know, I've seen the, like, Vladimir Grove Jr., the finish to a swing looks like Vlad Sr. But obviously, D'Angelo Ortiz, different side of the plate, different athleticism, different body, different swing. Yeah. A pitch is high. And Ortiz draws the walk. The game gets a little bit later. Plenty of baseball left, but as it gets a little bit later, everything gets a little bit more interesting. And we're talking about head coach Jeff Johnson and all that he has earned. Over this past winter, also went into the Florida Baseball Hall of Fame. Think about that. It's one thing to be the, the JUCO representative, but... When you go in in, the, in the, the, the Florida Athletics, I should say, Hall of Fame. Not just baseball, but athletics. As that one is outside. When he went in with this year's class, it was with Leroy Butler, Vince Carter, Greg Coleman, Tom Coughlin, Elaine Larson, and Shannon Miller. So legends of multiple sports along with Coach Jeff Johnson of Chipola. Wow. it's impressive, huh? Amazing. Takes it all in stride. Mariana is his home, and it, the, uh, the the opportunities that the man who's coaching this team on defense now has had to go coach elsewhere, and it's just not for him. He's home. This, this is where he wants to coach. He handles the athletic director role as well there, and he's built such a special thing at the JUCO level. He certainly has, and tremendous success. And by the way, our thoughts and prayers going out to Florida State baseball coach Mike Martin's family passing away. Uh, at the age of 79, and I know he's been struggling for a while, and and uh, but certainly he has impacted so many different professional baseball players, college baseball players, young men uh, are around the country. 40 seasons, a coach there, uh, and a great career. But uh, the, the passing of Mike Martin from Florida State certainly our thoughts and prayers go out to this family. I know that touches you with your partner too, as well. Yeah. You worked so many hours with Eduardo Perez, who was mentored by Mike and played for him as a Pedro, younger man. Pedro Grafal, the manager of the White Sox, also uh, part of that yeah. Florida State family. And both Eduardo and Grafal inducted into the Florida State Baseball Hall of Fame, or Florida State Hall of Fame, this past year. That pitch is outside. Pitching coach Rush Hickson is who made that visit, by the way. First season as the pitching coach, wrapped up last year. He was a head coach, head baseball coach at Pike Liberal Art School in Troy, Alabama. 
and now has found his home handling the pitchers here at Chipola. Three and one. Jeremy Garcia singled. Back in the second inning. And then he was picked off. And it wasn't really close. Well, somebody's got to be the guinea pig. And unfortunately, it was Garcia to learn about the move uh, from Lucas Ellisalt and how good it was. And now everybody else somewhat can dive back and land on their belly button on the base. They're so close. Isn't that the truth? We always pointed out as broadcasters, hey, look at that baseball fan or viewer. You have one hitter that learns something. He's telling the other on his way off the diamond. That's how it's done in the big leagues. Well, I think in this case it was pretty simple. It was yeah. Garcia walking back. Hey, guys, in case you didn't know it, he now yeah. know yeah. he has a good move. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Runner at first, good long pause, three, two, swung on and missed, throw down on a hop. Strike him out, throw him out, a double play. Well done Buchan right with there. a great throw, huh? Yes, Buchan with, a, Buchan with a good throw. Here comes the pitch, that's strike three, good breaking ball, quick, strong release, nice pick uh, at short by J.P. Ortiz, slapping on the tag and getting it right there. Nice job, well done. Yeah, got the tag down, and, and uh, you did see uh, Ortiz peeking in, but uh, not quite fast enough. Oh, you love that. You love that if you're on the mound, and that's what happens. Kerry Herndon Brown, the first baseman now. Went after a pitch up in the zone, skies that one into center field. Taylor is there, and that is out number three. The inning started with a walk. It ends with a fly out to center field. He eventually faced the minimum in this one. It is a pitcher's kind of day thus far in the final game of day one of the Panama City Beach College Baseball Classic. We're scoreless. let myself believe that I was going to be in the big leagues. I always worked for it until I achieved it. Back in Puerto Rico, I remember my dad would hit me ground balls from the top of the hill. That forced me to always move my feet. There were no limits to where I could go, so I played with no limits. delivery to the plate in, in probably 1.3 seconds or less and it certainly gave a lot of it, uh, Xander Bucon uh, Bucan, an opportunity to throw him out on, on the base at second base what, what a friend to a catcher you know oh it's huge right it's a team it takes a team right it's not just one guy but a lot of times you know the catcher gets the credit for the caught stealing but the pitcher played a big part in that one because he has a great move he picked a runner off he threw over earlier in the at bat, getting in the in Ortiz's mind that he's got to shorten his lead a little bit, and because of that, 
It allowed that strike him out, throw him out, double play. And listen, good pick at, at shortstop as well by Ortiz to make the tag. Here, here. So here we go now. It's not late yet. Not at all late yet, but we are into the bottom half of the fourth inning for Chipola. These teams have combined for just five hits in this game. J.C. Vanek ready to roll. And he goes after the first pitch, fouls that one off the left-handed batter. Good pitch outside and off the plate. Now you watch Vanek and watch the energy that he has in his at bat, right? And you think about big league hitters, how calm they seem to be sometimes. And I think as he gets more experience, you'll see him calm that energy level down a little bit. Because what can happen is you get so hyper that you jump at the ball when the pitch is coming. It's hard to stay back. I know he wants to stay hyped up, but it's intensity without tension is what you're gunning for. Bannock played for Coach Glenn Caccini at Barb High School in Louisiana. Was originally an LSU commit. Found a better fit at least to begin his college career at Chipola. Well, you know, Darren, program, people, a really good one. People might hear you say that and think, wait a minute. Now, he was an LSU commit, and then he, he chose this instead. It's because going there at a four-year school, he probably wouldn't have played early on because of COVID and the extra years of eligibility. Pretty swing. Lines that one toward the alley in right center field. It's down. Played nicely on a hop by Michael Perez. And there's a base hit for Vanek. We'll see see that one again, and I know you were making a point as well. Yeah, so, you know, the chance to get at bats, right, to just get playing time where he might be watching at LSU. Here he is getting at a bat and doing this, being able to hit, take a ball, drive it up the middle, then round the bases, figure out, get a read about his judgment. Can I go for two right here? It's just, it's the playing gives you so much more to learn from. Yeah, practicing and being around the other guys certainly can help, but this is such a big difference, playing time. John Cassidy Vanek, his given name, upon graduation, was the number one first baseman as ranked by a perfect game in the state of Louisiana. Family purchase Here's a good family one. fans, I guess, huh? Yep. Cassidy? Yeah. I think you and I were counting down the moments to see J.P. Ortiz hit again. We were talking about seeing a player that looked like a pro prospect. Boy, the Red Stoss, so 17th round pick this past year. What are some of those characteristics? Let's dive deeper on what you're saying. When you say looks like a prospect, what are you seeing? Well, just his body actions, his movements, his presence about him. He reminds me of Jeremy Pena for the Houston Astros a little bit. Balance, intensity. Uh, I mean, he just has the, the, the glide that many major league players have that, that – he can turn it on, but even at a normal pace, it looks smooth and easy. So at the 2021 National Showcase, a couple of years back, he ran a 6-6-60, threw 95 across the infield, mm. and pitched and touched 93. Couldn't square that one up. But it's well struck nonetheless. It's funny, he didn't get solid contact on that. That was closer to his hands, and he still drove that one to the center field. Board. Yeah, he's, he's, he, wow. I like him. But how about my, give Michael Perez a play out yep. there in center field, too, again. Yeah, that ball, I'll tell you what, he's got a nice short swing, uses his bottom half in it. Even if he doesn't center it exactly, he drives it. But that's an outstanding reaction and adjustment by Perez out in center field. We've seen him make a number of plays out there right now and taking good angles and approaches on fly balls. That's a lot to like about him. Here's Knox Bennett. Knox just turned 21 years old as he takes that one in and off the plate. 
Now, you would have leaned into that one, Darren, wouldn't you, have let that one hit you? 100%. No batting yeah. gloves, no pads, no elbow, <laughs> anything. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Although I didn't hit in college, so that's why it's easy for me to say that. Mm, just pitched. So, sure, why not? I like it. That one trickles a little bit away. Interesting here. Take, trying to keep Vanek so close at first base and, and the opposing first baseman. And not necessarily a big speed guy over there, but a lot of attention being paid. And, I, you know, I want to make sure the attention being paid to Bennett here at the plate. Right back through the box, diving play, and can't make it. A good effort there, but it slipped right on by. Zamora gave it all he had. Runners on first and third. Knox with a base hit. And Chipola making some noise. Knox with a knock right there, going right back up the middle. And we've seen so many good approaches here today of hitters thinking about going back up the middle, not trying to do too much with it. And again, keeping his hands back. With, with Fernandez, he throws so many off-speed pitches. You really need to keep your hands back, look fastball, but be able to wait on that pitch and still go back up the middle with it. May not drive it over the wall, but still make solid contact. We'll have a conversation, and of course, Stetson Bennett, the legendary quarterback, a couple of times a national champ, is uh, of course directly related to Knox. Well, look who's leading this conversation. I mean, the, the conversation's being led by the man on the mound. I love that. Nothing better than a pitcher that knows what he wants yeah. to do. Yeah. He's in charge out there for sure. You know, he's got a lot of moxie. You know, he doesn't have overpowering stuff, but he knows who he is on the mound, and he knows what he has to do. Now he's in another situation where he's going to need a strikeout or double play to keep that runner from scoring on third, try to strand him there. Xander Buchan. Takes that one the other way, lines it in the left field. It is down for a base hit, kicks away. Not too far away, but a run will score. And Chipola, they strike first. They lead Miami Day one to nothing. Well, if you can't go in the other way with it and getting a pitch up in the zone. Again, those pitches up in the zone, even if with an aluminum bat, if you don't center it, you still have a chance to be able to muscle it in to left field. And he was able to get the bat, enough of the bat head through to it to drive it. And, and unfortunately, Guzman not able to read it, to come in, charge, and make a sliding catch. The ball kicked away from him a little bit, but it did allow the run to score uh, with Vanek coming in uh, and sliding at home plate. Jordan Taylor now. That one popped up high into the right side. Runners are on first and second. Xander with that single. Taylor's 0 for 2. Fly out and a ground out. Owen to the count. He really gets tall on top of that pitch. I mean, that's, that is a straight downward breaker. 75 miles an hour. There it is again. Nice job blocking it up. Santiago Carrillas behind the plate. Now for Taylor, situational hitting right here. First and second, one out. Trying to see if they can't keep this inning rolling. Boy, putting on a display back there. Yeah. Well blocked play right there. Korea's excellent, excellent job. Again, it's not trying to catch it. It's trying to smother it and then keep it right in front. And if you do that, you keep the runners from advancing. Knows the breaking ball's coming, expecting it in the dirt. That's just excellent. He made it look easy. That's exactly how you do it. Yeah. 
baseball is such a game of nuance, isn't it, folks? You have two guys like Steve and I, and I'm sure you're geeking out with us, but that's as fun and as exciting as anything you'll see on the field when you see a defensive player execute like that catcher did. Because it proves the amount of work he's put in. Yep. I mean, and and I think seen, part of it, too. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. I was going to say, we've seen a lot of wild pitches today. We've seen a lot yeah. of breaking balls that have gotten away from catchers today. And, and what we've seen from Koreas is that willingness to just sacrifice your body, smother the baseball. Maybe it's a little tougher on that turf as well. Maybe that's why. And he is rewarded for keeping those out front with another swing and a miss. And the pitcher trusting the ability to throw that pitch down there. Right. He knows that his catcher can block it. That is outstanding. And for Taylor, he takes the strikeout right there. And again, the strikeout so critical. If you've got guys in scoring position, you know, the other team's looking to make contact, put it in play, find a hole. Getting that swing and miss is so important. Eddie and Espinal, Espy, they're calling him from the dugout. Had that triple, then he lined out to center field, hit a ball very hard back in the third as well. One and zero. Well, he's got a good, good approach at the plate. Just really gentle front stride, not jumping at the baseball, waiting for the pitch, calm and easy at the plate, and completely under control. That one grabs the corner. One ball and one strike. The count. But here's the thing: that wasn't a good pitch to hit. It's a strike. But I like that he understands that the first strike that he sees may not be the best one that he's going to get during the course of the at-bat. Wait it out a little bit and the courage to wait for a pitch deeper into the count. That's a block. That's a block. Gotta throw the baseball to first. I mean, they're, they're not holding the runner at first base either, so a mental mistake right there yeah. from uh, Fernandez, right? So the idea, runner's on first and second. You're not going to hold the runner on first anyways. And if no. you're going to do that, you better throw it over there and hope the first baseman makes the play. But don't throw it away. You're better off eating it and not letting a run score. But now two runners yeah. in scoring position. So Bach moves him up. And that one's smothered again behind home plate by Santiago. I tell you, I would be really careful right here with Espinal. Oh, Steve, I was just thinking base, the same right? thing. First base yes. open, uh, you know, and, you know, even if it was first and second, you got a base open, and this guy just scares me with him at the plate right now. So I, don't, I, don't give, I wouldn't give him anything too good to hit right here. Well, look, early season tells us a couple of things, and even this game, there is an explosive bat, and it's quick to the zone, and he's really patient. He's not going to chase on you. No. See, what you see watching him is intensity without tension. Where for some other hitters, they, they get a little uptight in, in jumping around on the box. Yeah, he kind of felt that, didn't he? He felt that that was coming. Yeah. That's, a, that's an unintentional, intentional walk at that point of the at-bat. That's a frame like Pirates' top prospect, Termar Johnson, for those of you that ever watched sure. Termar play. Kind of that diminutive frame, but just power packed within that frame. Tamar drew a bunch of walks last year in his minor league season. And an on base over 400. Zayad Diaz now. The bases are full. Turning point in the game, huh? I would say so. Probably the last hitter that Fernandez is going to face today would be my guess, whether he gets him or not. He's going to work from the windup with the bases loaded and two outs. Pulls the change up in, 1-0 and the count. Struck out and walked in this game. Oh, 
Rolls his hands in, high fly ball toward right field. Up against that wall, just shy of it though. I just missed it. I mean, he had to pull his hands in only so far he could go. J.C. Vanek got this inning going though, and because of that, we've got something on the board. Vanek reached out and slapped that baseball. Knox Bennett, a nice approach. He is rewarded. And then Xander Buchan with an RBI, the great catcher as well. Chipola leads it one to nothing. What a way to start the year, junior college baseball. Recently, we chatted with Craig Cozart, who leads the efforts of perfect game scouting at the college level. He shared with us and really opened up about the virtues of the modern state of JUCO baseball. People are realizing the value of a two-year education, if that's what you want. Um, but they also realize that, you know what, now community college, junior college, or two-year schools, if that's what we want to call it, are real legitimate options for guys that want to get better. I can say one thing about junior college players. Uh, the vast majority of them are there because they are obsessed with the game of baseball. They love the game. They'll do whatever it takes to play the game because you're still not getting all the glitz and the glamour that you're getting at an SEC or a Power 5 school. Uh, but the development is at a totally different level, and the amount of play that you get puts you at a different level as far as preparation is concerned to transition to a four-year school. Steve Phillips, Darren Sutton, and we go back to work with Miami Day trailing just by a, a score of, of one to nothing. Glad to have you with us. Steve, why don't you expound upon yeah. what he was saying there? You know, you know, it used to be that going to junior college was a consolation prize. Right, well, you didn't get to a four-year school, so you go to a two-year school, and maybe you'll get an opportunity and everything else. And now with, with what's happened uh, at, at major conferences and programs, with COVID giving players extra years of eligibility, you've got a backup of talent and age there. Then you've got the transfer portal. And so, so many teams now can say, well, you know, I've got guys graduating. Let me go get another incoming junior somebody who's played two years somewhere else and they just keep recycling older players bringing them in right there and so now what you see is the junior college is giving kids an opportunity who might go to a four-year program and sit and watch for a couple of years until they get their crack at it and now they're getting playing time and an opportunity one to even go to professional baseball not even go to the four-year school and still get their education which is extremely important boy that is perfectly said like that is perfectly stroked by Carlos Hakame, line drive into center field, following the seventh strikeout of the game for Ellis Salt. But they need that. They just need base runners to get it going. Well, he's twice in this game allowed a single or a single or a walk and then a pickoff and a caught stealing, and it's been a 1 2 3 inning. Uh, and so he set up again with one out here, man on. And the running game has been completely shut down by Lucas Ellis Salt in this one. Let's see, what shall it be this time? 
Round ball double play maybe to keep it to the minimum? Yeah. We shall see. Now, Miami-Dade hopes that's not the case. Lazaro Giannis, their legendary coach, 30 years of experience coaching, managing, and scouting student-athletes. They named him as the head coach back in September. Marlins and a Brewer scout, a real big teacher of the game for so long. He has his team dropping down a bunt. Yeah, bunting on his own. That's a nice play. Simple things that happen, but Xander Buchan makes that play. Not an easy play from behind home plate. That is an outstanding play. You know, you don't often talk about range for catchers. Right? I mean, it's not really a fact. Range in the outfield, range in the infield important. But that was range of a catcher pouncing on that ball coming out from behind home plate and then getting his feet shifted and making a strong throw there. Now, I don't love that as a baseball play. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, giving yourself up with already one out in the inning to advance the runner, uh, but an opportunity here for now Michael Perez to see if he can't capitalize on it. I'm going to guess he did that on his own. Just a guess. And a nice job keeping it there by Xander. You know, the game's changed. I mean, even the college game has changed where, you know, college baseball, they would always sacrifice butt. Man, on for, you know, leadoff man got on, they butt him over, they try to get him in, that sort of thing. But I think the analytics have made their way and filtered down to college baseball, too, where you understand giving up an out in a situation may not be the way to go. Now, Zamora did strike out his first time up. Maybe he's not confident in his, in his swing of the bat right now. But now it puts an awful lot of pressure on Perez to deliver. Pretty breaking ball, one and one the count. You also think about Miami Dade, and you think about its rich history with Raul Ibanez, Placido Polanco, Andres Torres, Mike Piazza, the late Alex Fernandez, Warren Cromarty. So many amazing names that have worn a Miami Dade uniform. As that one has rolled foul. Well, we saw Perez earlier with a a double in this game, which really looked like a single off the bat. But you know what? He said, I'm going to just, I'm going to hustle. I'm going to get there. I'm reading the center fielder. I know what I can do in time and space and speed and instincts. And he knew that he could beat it out with the way the center fielder, Jordan Taylor, moved going after that ball on the base hit to center field. Oiled that breaking ball. Not quite sure how he did that. Staying alive. And I will tell you that, that looking at, at Hakimi leading off second base, he is set up for the daylight play, uh, potentially for J.P. Ortiz to drop in behind him. He keeps inching off a little bit further, a little bit further. See if they put a play on here. One and two the count. That one was his low and outside. Well, being two and former, two. Being a former shortstop with where the umpire is set up there, it's a tough place to be for Ortiz because you're jockeying behind the runner and you're trying to keep him close to the bag, but the umpire's kind of set up right in your line of vision and you've got to kind of hop back almost further toward third base than you want to. You see where the umpire is there. Picked on a breaking ball, hits a high fly ball in the center field, ranging over, over the shoulder, makes the play Jordan Taylor. That ball had some giddy up and carry to it as well. That keeps it as a zero, though, on the other side for the opposing squad, Chipola. Just enough. They're now counting down outs as they lead it. To the bottom of the fifth we go, one to nothing. What's going on guys? I am with Soldier Sports and they just newly released their tank BB Core Drop 3. Uh, the pop is insane. It's got incredibly good feel. Feels a little bit like a voodoo with that balance feel. Uh, the hand is great, little flare knob. Um, but we're going to take some swings here, check out some extra velos and see how it tests. 97. 99. So as you can see, I mean, this thing's hot. Uh, it's got great feel. I'm really loving it. So go check it out. Soldier Sports US. Let's go. Being in the wild is the best when you're with your family. We do all kinds of different things at camp. 
Go fish. Surf. Dive. I think I'll probably be coming out here the rest of my life. His job is quite simple in a one to nothing game. Steve talked about it in our last game, the importance of a reliever pitching down a run or two. Just as important as a setup man or a closer, you got to keep it here. Right, we, we talk so much about bullpens. Boy, we got to hold the lead. We got to close out the game and everything else. But those teams that win a lot, that end up with the better records, are the teams that not only win the games where they have a lead in the game and hold on, but where you hold the deficit and allow your good offense to try to come back and, and chip away and add some runs. We saw it certainly uh, earlier today uh, and uh, uh, the opportunity to try to get some big outs in situations where it looked like it was going to be a slugfest. And whoever can hold that deficit and allow their team to come back is the one that can ultimately win a game. As those locks flow out from underneath his hat, let me tell you a little bit about what he said about himself to us. And it's just... Four simple words as he describes his repertoire. Here it is. Fastball, sinking fastball, slider, and a changeup. That's what he leans on when he's out on the mound. His favorite team, the Yankees. His favorite pitcher, Spencer Strider. And this right-hander who loves Spencer Strider goes to work against Brantley Willis, 1-0. I think Spencer Strider is going to be a lot of people's favorites moving forward. He is some kind of stuff. And he's a person, I'm probably listening to him talk about pitching. He is so intelligent, Spencer Strider. He knows himself and he knows what he needs to do. 2 and 0 the count. It feels like pitchers that put thought into it. Thinking man's pitching, if you will, seem to appeal to young athletes as that one is high, 3-0 and the count. So for Karasquilla coming in, in a little bit of a feel like he's trying to miss, bat, miss a bat. You know, you've got to throw it, trust your stuff, attack the zone, especially coming out of the bullpen, especially to the leadoff hitter in an inning in a one-run game. Boom, 3-1 and one the count, pours that one in there. Brantley walked and struck out. Got the corner. Three and two. Well, he's throwing nothing but fastballs so far. And uh, not having thrown any breaking ball yet, I would sit on a fastball, obviously, and, and really look to try to drive it. Up to 88 miles an hour. That's outside. It's ball four. And you find yourself, as you mentioned, in position to, to feeling like one more run would feel like five more runs. Yeah, it's what, you know, you see a lot of coaches that don't have any hair or they have white hair like you and I. <laughs> it's when pitchers, relievers come in and walk the leadoff hitter in an inning. It, it gets you old so quickly. It's amazing what it does to you. Looks like Rob Gordon's going to run out there at first. Rob Gordon, if I heard correctly. Again, that's just me listening in to the exchanges. Dives him back to the bag, and that's exactly who it is. Number four thought, on that jersey, Rob Gordon. I thought he said we have a 7 o'clock reservation at Gordon's. <laughs> well, they, they better hurry. <laughs> they better hurry. Although that was our middle broadcast. This game's going at a really nice clip. Big Sam Parker. Got a huge cut. That almost flattened out like a changeup. Not sure if it was. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it didn't move the way he wanted it to move, but it was up in the zone enough. And, 
Boy, I mean, Parker looks like a low ball hitter, but you know, we've seen everybody pitching at the top of the zone. We see it in Major League Baseball. We've seen it here today. So many pitches at the top. If he gets something down, he can do some damage. He is flying, but they are throwing, and an excellent job applying the tag. Hagame came flying through the air, grabbed hold of the throw by Santiago Carrillas, and popped it down. Yeah, it was a throw that sort of leaked away from Carrillas toward right field. But give Hockamy some credit to be able to come off the base, catch it, and and at least try to slap the tag on on the the legs or the backside uh, of uh, uh, Diaz going in or Brantley. Or I'm sorry, it was Gordon going in the pinch runner, throwing out on the play. Try to show that one and frame it up. It was low and in. To Sam Parker. And to the backstop it goes. We're talking about the, the strength of Sam and seeing him as a younger athlete. Twins drafting him 19th round this past year. Just past his 19th birthday. Rolls that one out to second. A little bit off the mark, but hanging around the bag, Kerry Herndon Brown. Two outs. You can see why Parker would get drafted. I mean, he's a physical specimen. And, you know, I think teams look at it and think that, that he just needs reps and time. But you can close your eyes and dream when a guy's built like that, that if he has some skills and some tools, that you could turn him into a great baseball player. And so you take him a little late in the draft and try to catch lightning in a bottle. He chooses to go back to school, hoping to develop, so he gets taken earlier and makes more money next year. J.C. Vanek spits at a good breaking ball that's down and in. That all makes sense. What a wonderful place to be in if you're talking about an athlete like that getting drafted. That means you've earned the right to make some decisions. Uh, have a little bit of, of leverage, if you will, and if it doesn't work out long term, to crank up that education as well. Created opportunities for himself when you speak about Sam Parker. Because I'm guessing, I want to just finish the, the thought on this with your experience, your lengthy experience. I mean, if you do pick him 19th in a 20 round draft, there was some sort of number they could have found, right? Yeah, I think so. And again, you've got you know you've got a, a pool, but you can you can certainly find a way to make a deal. And if it's going to take a little more to buy him out of it with this sort of physical ability, I would do it. Yeah, and that's why I find it interesting. I, I think back in the day, quote unquote, there may have been a later in the draft pick, just relationally, correct? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And there's no question about that. I mean, I, you, you you could do that now with 20 rounds. You you can't really yeah. do, you can't do something like that anymore. That's where I think I was going. And, you know, if you pick pick 19 out of 20, they, there's some thought like, okay, let's see where this could go, you know? Yeah. I think for all of these young men, though, that uh, the idea of going on and getting your education, whether you go to a junior college or to, to uh, a four-year school, get your education along the way. 3-2 pitch. Low ball four. You know, I signed know, out of still high in the upper 80s. I, I signed out of high school myself, and uh, uh, but every off season I went back to get a semester of college in, and so it took me eight years to get my degree, one semester at a time. But I realized that if I had waited until the end of my minor league career, I thought, okay, let me go back to school now. I was 24, 25 years old at that point, and you know, then four more years of college to take you to 29. And so the idea of continuing your education while you're playing is really important. Line drive, center field, base hit, J.P. Ortiz. And I'm going to tell you what. You talk about the actions that appeal to you as a player development and a scout as you are with all you've done. You could see him in that single swing. Yeah, there's no question about it. He really reminds me of Jeremy Pena, the shortstop for the Astros. Very athletic, flexible. 
taking that pitch up of the zone, muscling it into center field. I really believe, I mean, just watching him today, we're going to see him on a major league field someday. I mean, J.P. Ortiz, he is, he is a really interesting young player. He runs well. He's got pop. He's flexible. He's balanced. That pitch is high. How long did you play, Steve, until you, your mid-20s? I played seven years in the minor leagues uh, for the Mets. Okay. And, uh, and then, you know, finished my degree and then got back into the front office for 13 years with the Mets. I think everyone is so knowledgeable as the 1-0 big swing of your very front-facing. When you run the Mets, I mean, that's about as high-profile job as you can have and successful career as a leader. I think a lot of people might forget that you did play for quite some time professionally. Yeah, seven years. I think I started turning gray when I was playing, too. So it, was, it started happening young. The 1-1. One, one. Beat him in with a the pitch there. But I'll tell you that having played, it gave me an understanding about what the players go through. I was a fifth-round draft pick, drafted ahead of Roger Clemens in, in 1981, in fact, by the Mets. The Mets drafted Clemens 12th round. I was fifth round, and uh, but having played, it gave me the understanding about how to relate to players who were prospects, who were suspects, who struggled, who had success, uh, and then in the front office, running the minor leagues, hiring managers and coaches. Blew him away with that fastball. The wisdom of Steve Phillips on a show like this, we understand why. We'll continue that conversation. And follow this great game here in Panama City Beach as the lights take effect. One to nothing, Chipola on top. Meet Austin Brown, and for Austin Brown, a chance to pitch in the college baseball scene. This is a right-handed pitcher who's just a freshman from O'Fallon, Illinois, Triad High School. High school coaches Jesse Bugger and Sam Weber. Uh, it's a big chance to be in for Austin, a one-to-nothing nail-biter. And Austin already has pitched this year, so he's seen some time out of the pen. Pitched four innings, gave up three runs, struck out a pair in his college debut. Well, I'll tell you what, 6'5", 155. <laughs> I mean, so, like, we're talking lean and mean right here, but you look at him and you start closing your eyes and dreaming about him filling out and getting a man body and what that could look like and what it could do to add to his strength as he builds up and grows, right? He's just a long, loose, lanky baby right now, young man. But you know what I mean? Physically, he hasn't grown into his body yet. But this is what scouts, you know, drool about. Now, there's, I think, one scout with a radar gun behind the plate. We'll see if the other ones make their way over. But when I would see a six foot five, 155 pounder that's pitching in college baseball, I get really excited. 
because you start thinking about the physical growth and development and what that does to add velocity. When you get a guy this size and he fills out and you get the angles and leverage that he has, it could be really exciting in a prospect. Just turned 19 years old as he tumbles off the mound just a bit as that one misses outside. The son of Mike and Courtney is Austin Brown. Michael Petit is his foe on the other side. Ready for that fastball, hits it hard. Into the corner it goes. Petit hurries around. He eyes second. Thinks about third, but he slips and tumbles over the bag, over the turf. It is a double to lead things off. That's what you want if you're Miami Day. Well, you know what? Ellisalt out of the game, who's been so good and effective, and it's one of those situations. Wait, let's get that guy out, and whoever else they bring in, we've got a chance to score. Uh, but look at that right there. Cutting the base tight. Excellent job driving the baseball, picking up the third base coach. Well coached, well executed. Pretty good job. Oh, he's not checking what time it is there. It's uh, how they're deciding what pitches to throw. Breaking ball. Boy, that's a good one. What a good pitch to start him off with, too. Swung on and missed by Dean Guzman. You know, as a hitter, uh, when you look at Austin Brown, he's all arms and legs coming at you. You know, there's a lot of distraction with a guy that big. Uh, and, you know, the difficulty for a pitcher that big, who's still this young and doesn't have the core strength, is the ability to repeat your delivery. You know, that ability to just consistently get your body in the right place there's a lot of moving parts for big pitchers, and, and so it's going to take a little time for him to build some strength and some core, but at some point, he does look like quite a, a, a good-looking body on the mound. One and one the count as that one misses away to Guzman. Brown. Hails from the portion of Illinois, O'Fallon, that's closer to St. Louis. So he's in the greater St. Louis area. There's a good breaking ball, one and two. In the 2023 season, he had the lowest DRA in the St. Louis area. Most strikeouts in the St. Louis area. Slider, two-seamer, four-seamer. Curveball changeup, that's what he shared. Well, there is something special about that breaking ball. That's strike three. Yeah, right? He can really spin it. You, you look at a big guy like that, and you think to yourself, oh, okay, I'm going to interested to see what his fastball is. But a big man that can spin the baseball like that, when that fastball does develop, that's exciting. You make a great point. I know you've touched on this, too. But right now, he's dealing with a mid-'80s fastball, in this game anyway. D'Angelo Ortiz. But a guy like Jeff Johnson, who spent his life, Hall of Fame career, eyeing and developing players that may be even a little rough around the edges. This seems to suit Chipola and Jeff just right. Well, the thing you can do, you can wait on a guy like this to develop his fastball because he, he's not naked on the mound. He's got the breaking pitch that allows him to get outs when he needs it and wait for the fastball to develop. Nothing wrong with that fastball, one and one. Little tailing action to it, kind of a backdoor two seamer. Runner at second. That's the tying run. It's been that nail biting close the entire time as it is fully dark here in Panama City Beach. Those lights, well, they got great lights here at the yard. Left the breaking ball up that time. Into right field for a base hit. Toward the plate. We are tied. He had shown and thrown that breaking ball so effectively until he didn't. And when he hung that one, Ortiz took advantage. Well, little Poppy coming up with the big RBI right there. David Ortiz's son. 
Uh, D'Angelo Ortiz gets a pitch up in the zone. Doesn't try to do too much, right? That ability to drive it to right field. He moved his upper body back and cleared his hands to be able to stay inside the baseball, driving it to right field. And you see the play there. Diaz not able to throw out the runner at the plate. And I would have loved Ortiz to go to second on that throw to the plate. When that throw went through, I sure would have liked him to end up in second base in scoring position right there. That changes things for Garcia, certainly, where a single could give his team the lead. He singled back in the second. He also struck out. Yeah, picked on a hanging breaking ball, 71 miles an hour. That one misses outside from the freshman, 2-0 oh, the count. On the job training if you're Austin Brown, getting comfortable in college baseball. Pulls that one on the ground. A flip for one. On to first. In time, a double play. J.P. Ortiz started it in a beautiful matter. Eddie and Espinal turned it right over. On to J.C. Vanek. A single in the RBI, a big difference in the inning. But, oh, how nice that double play. A little two-seam tilt on that fastball. This is the big blow, though, by D'Angelo Ortiz. They've tied us up here at one. What a good one. I never let myself believe that I was going to be in the big leagues. I always worked for it until I achieved it. Back in Puerto Rico, I remember my dad hit me ground balls from the top of the hill. That forced me to always move my feet. There were no limits to where I could go, so I play with no limits. This game is, you know, in a day and age where I think we sometimes might stereotype college baseball as being offensive heavy and lengthy and long, this game has not been that at all. It's been a well-defensed game, athletic pitchers on the mound, and we're tied at one. The, the pitchers have owned this game. Well, it makes such a big difference with the games we've watched, right? When pitchers throw strikes and don't put extra base runners on, it's a crisper game. It's the defense is staying involved in all of it. Uh, and you limit the number of the base runners. The traffic is much less on the bases. Takes a tumble on the mound. Still a pretty pitch from Brandon Vasquez. Elite squad, his travel team, when he was back playing travel ball, Palm Beach Central High School is where he earned his diploma back in 2022. This left hand of the son of Emily and Robert. It's interesting, I, I see the actions. It's got a little John Franco and a little Jesse Orozco in him from back in the day. And that's, uh, you know, John Franco, one of my pitchers, long time with the Mets. Uh, but, uh, you know, a guy that uh, really had a very effective and great career. Both those left-handers had long careers, too, pitching into the early 40s. Xander Buchan goes after that one. Has to drive that one toward the center field wall, but it dies out there. 
in front of Michael Perez, who, by the way, has been a pleasure to watch play the position. Very nice job out there for him. He's made a number of running plays, and he's made it look easy. Elgin Bennett with a chance to hit now. Elgin was at Kansas State, went to Woodward Academy in Fayetteville, Georgia prior to that. Elgin hits that one hard. Diving attempt, unable to make the play. There's Bennett, hops off the bench. Elgin Bennett, former East Cobb Astros star. Comes in at the perfect time and delivers exactly what Chipola needs. Boy, it makes Jeff Johnson look like a genius, too. Right? Let me take the guy off the bench, bring him in there. That's a good piece of hitting. Left on left, coming off the bench and being able to come through with a base hit right there. You see the exit velocity, being able to get by Zamora quickly without an ability to make a play. I've been watching Elgin for a long time play amateur baseball. It's... Been my pleasure for the 2022 grad. Saw him at the National Showcase a couple of years back in 21. He was ranked the number seven outfielder overall upon graduation in the state of Georgia. And if I recall Elgin, and I'm, a, I'm going to cross-check my memory, I want to make sure, but yeah, it's correct. There was a time, Elgin Bennett, as he stands there at first, at Perfect Games National Showcase back in 2021, or he ran a 60. I believe it was less than 6'2. He ran a 6'1 for 60. Wow. Back wow. in 2021. Wow. Well, something to keep an eye on here. You got a guy who can really run. Left handed pitcher on the mound. We haven't seen the move yet uh, from Brandon Vasquez. Uh, but also, uh, Espinal at the plate. Guy that can really swing the bat. Bennett with the single, Espinal. Had that triple, now takes up and away. Eddie and Espinal. Those swings were from the left side. This switch hitter now we're seeing for the first time from the right side. That's another arrow in his quiver. He's a switch hitter. I think when he showed bunt, I don't think he was looking to bunt. I think he just wanted to show it, maybe to creep the infielders in a little bit, take away some of the deeper depth of the infield and the angles where they might be able to make a play and see if he can't find a hole to drive the ball through. Vasquez well aware of the man at first and his speed. Rushed that one home and a high strike gets the call there, two and one. We saw Espinal take some, some strikes from the left side, understanding, again, the first strike might not be the best one. He takes that one there. It looked like it was up and away a little bit. Not necessarily a great pitch for him to drive. And it took a tumble on that turf mound. Yeah, again for Three Vasquez. Three and one to count. It's the second or third time that he slipped on the mound out there. It is, and, and I know, can't we, tell... If he's just wearing turfs there, Steve, or what he's doing. Yeah, but what it does is it makes you think about your footing when you're pitching, mm -hmm. and that's not anything you want to do. Oh, he makes such a great point. The last thing you want to do, and you can expound upon this, is be tentative going down that hill. Right, thinking about where my landing point is and everything. Now, look, he aggressively threw that last pitch. Runner on the move. He just bluffed. Drew the throw. Doesn't matter. It's ball four. A bluff, then a walk. Bottom half of inning number six. Your go-ahead run is right there. Zayad Diaz. Walked back in the third. That's the lone time he has reached. Yeah. 
One and oh. Well, Vasquez struggling a little bit to find the strike zone right now, and this is where you have to keyhole it. You have to say, if it's not the perfect pitch, I'm going to let it go. Pulls his hands in. It's on the ground. The only play is out front, but you'll take that. That's a big, big second out. Runners do move to second and third. So I think as the Mora gets more comfortable, I, you know, that's in the major leagues, you'll see the second baseman still try to get the out at second. Try to get, try to take that runner out of scoring position right there. Go get it, be aggressive, and try to get, try to get that spin and get the out at second base right there. It's a concession to get the out at first, but you know, as you get more comfortable and you understand your ability, you want to get that runner at second base to only let the runner in third be in scoring position in case there is a base hit. Rob Gordon transferred in from Vanderbilt. Been watching him play for many years. Rob gets the call to pinch hit. One of my favorites as well. One and one the count. Good to see Rob out there. He is from Grady High School in Mableton. A sophomore now, as we mentioned, transferred in from Vanderbilt. Talk about a deep roster, huh, folks? Yeah. Outside. Now, obviously, with that little ground ball out that we talked about for the second out, this makes the catcher-pitcher relationship essential. If it kicks away, that go-ahead run scores. And there it is at third. World-class speed, not far off. Gordon serves that one toward right field. It's down! A Texas leaguer one run will score is there a second you bet two runs and Gordon hurries on around he grabs an extra bag and look at that Chipola dugout they lead it three to one two big pinch hits in this inning the last one by Gordon and for Gordon remember he came in and pinch ran earlier and got uh, caught stealing on a strike him out throw him out double play and so now he gets a chance for redemption Able to take the ball, just punch it into right field, and just enough. Good jump off of second base as well uh, as uh, Espinal coming around to score. And again, that, that out, that they got the out at first base instead of getting the runner at second has led to two runs coming in in this situation uh, in this game. Well, it's got to feel great for Gordon. Both Elgin Bennett and Rob Gordon get the call to pinch hit and both deliver this inning. You said Gordon had tuned up his legs, but not the bat in this game. Not yet. Good shot of Elgin inside that dugout. And another look. Michael Hugas comes off the bench. He is out of Pittsburgh. This is another top prospect. From Shaler Area High School is Michael, 6'3", 205, pitcher and an outfielder. Seeing the, a line change here for Jeff Johnson. I tell you, his moves are working, too. Like, everybody he's bringing in is getting the job done. He's making him look like a genius that he is. So upon his graduation, this is a top 175 player. So he was... One of the best players in the country. Pittsburgh, PA. Penn, PG grade. Just turned 19 years old. Two and one. A little bit older upon graduation. High bouncing ball, not an easy play. There is no play, and it's 4-1, to one, and Gordon races home. Well, you know, that's one of the things, again, it's, it's, all of it's an opportunity to learn and teaching opportunities. So the throw from the outfield uh, from Michael Pettit that went over the head that allowed uh, Gordon to go to second base, and then the wild pitch in the dirt to let him get to third, 
again, the infield hit leads to another run coming in. And so it's those sort of cheap runs where extra bases were given that have come back and cost you in what could be a close game. Owen won the count. J.C. Vanek keeps his spot. All three pinch hit assignments in this inning got hits. All three of them. Bennett, Gordon, Hugas, all of them. And then the little things that Steve pointed out as the plays developed allowed Chipola to cash in. One and two. J.C. singled and scored in the fourth inning. Two and two. You know, for Vasquez, he's going to feel badly. But, you know, it was a CNI ground ball that went out to right field that allowed the two runs to score. He got the fielder's choice. He got the runner at second. Uh, and then an infield chopper that leads to another run coming in. And, and he feels like, boy, what a horrible day. But it really wasn't that bad. Break ball inside corner. That's strike three. Despite trying to throw a knee at it, J.C. Vanek did not get clipped. But you know what? There was enough clipping going on. It was pinch hitter party extraordinaire. It was Elgin coming off the bench. It was Rob coming off the bench. It was Hugas as well. There's Gordon's beautiful little Texas leaguer that did exactly what he hoped it would do. And Chipola has all kinds of fun in that last half inning and grabs the lead four to one. Three outs to a victory. Well, that stopped on a dime, didn't it, folks? And things got interesting. And Chipola, thanks to a little bit of help, but again, making a ton of contact, timely hitting, relaxed at bats as pinch hitters, grabbed the lead by a score of 4-1. to one. And now, Mr. Austin Brown, we pass the baton to you. Let's see if he can run this last leg and take it to the finish line as that two-seamer dives low to carry Herndon Brown. One and one. Couple of outs in the air for Kerry Herndon Brown. This one on the ground, right behind the second base bag. Waited back on that one, and with the kind of speed that Kerry has, there's no chance to make that play, playing it back, whether there was a play at all. Yeah, there may not have been, but that's a ground ball that is a shortstop. You've got to go get it. You, you said it exactly right there, and he let it play him. He laid back on it, 
and you've got to go make your hop. Go get your hop. Don't let the hop play you. And because of the speed of, of Herndon Brown, he was able to beat it out. But you've got to go get that ball. Almost get it right at second base and try to make, you know, quickly get it released and throw to first. A human moment for J.P. Ortiz. For as special as he is. Out over the plate, that one, high fly, shallow center field, Jordan Taylor turns it into an out, fires that one back into Espinal. Elgin Bennett, by the way, is playing third base now. He stayed in as a third. Fugas is out in left field. One away. The number one in that jersey, Carlos Hakame, the shortstop. Rounded out the third, back in the third. He also singled. Right now, just looking to be a base runner. Get on any way you can. It's just a little bit of... Arm side run to this right hand. Yeah. Just enough to make him interesting, huh? Yeah, just to, you know, where it's tougher to center it on the bat, right? You think you're going to center it up, the ball just runs in on the label a little bit, and you can't quite drive it as hard. He's just kind of strike throwing this inning, pitching like a guy who does have three runs to work with. And you like seeing that. And I don't know if young athletes, baseball players, are into wins anymore as a stat, but kind of fun that he's got a chance to get his first college win oh they're into wins I mean you know when it comes down to analytics in the world they don't make they know it's a team stat but pitchers they like to get wins let me check myself in his first outing he got a win out of the pen too so he'd be 2-0 and in his first two college games how fun pretty good right well in this one too like you talk about it a team with a little bit of momentum he makes sure that he keeps things quiet. He does give up that single run, but pulls it together nicely. Now take this one to the house. Breaking ball grounded out toward third, ranging to his left. The underhanded play on to first. They won't turn it over. Too tough to do so. But a nice lead play there from third base to get it started. I'm not sure the underhand flip was probably the way to go is, is you know, I, from third base to do it. Even though his momentum's going there, I'd rather see sort of the dart throwing feed uh, as opposed to the underhand feed just because, you know, it's, it's softer. And if you're going to have any chance at a double play, you're going to want it overhand there. And look, I think maybe a little stronger feed to second base. It could have been closer at first because that was not that far off. David Zamora now. David dropped down a bunt last time up and struck out. One and one. Yeah, Brown being much more aggressive, starting the inning off and going right at them uh, and uh, really feeling much more confident in his command on the mound. Drops a breaking ball in there. One strike away from an opening victory of this tournament for Chipola. Breaking ball, popped up. Put away right into the glove, and Chipola is victorious. What a day of baseball. Watching these teams go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, representing the JUCO game in a strong matter. Three fun games, three really exciting games, and again, really well-played games. Just a handful of miscues defensively. This was fun to watch, Steve.
Oh, it was so much fun. We had a hidden ball trick. We had a great pickoff attempt. We had, uh, you know, guys sort of barking at each other a little bit. We had a couple home runs in, the, in it. We got some strikeouts. We've got some guys committed to major colleges that showed well for themselves. Some good athleticism, too. A lot of good stuff. So tomorrow, don't forget to join us. We've got a fun one for you, and certainly excited to, to bring you that getting going tomorrow. We'll be back with you with exciting baseball and We'll have a pair of games for you, but the first thing you need to know is that we'll be in your place first at 1030 Central, 1130 Eastern. If you're all the way out west, that's 830 in the morning. Northwest Florida State College, their head coach, Doug Martin, and Wabash Valley, the team that finished number two in the nation last year. So we'll start our day with that, and we'll do so from Publix Sports Park. Perfect game. Proud to be the presenter of the great amateur events globally and really excited to be the number one in this space. And more than anything, Perfect Game TV, your home for amateur baseball. On behalf of Steve Phillips, our entire production team, led by Steve Banta, Jason Duquette, and Jim Jenks, my name is Darren Sutton. We'll see you next time.